اعوذ بالله السميع العليم من العين الغوي الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الميامين المهديين المقتولين ولعنة الله أدائم على عدائهم إجمعين من يوم عدواتهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تكون كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون الله عز وجل في سورة الحشر آية 19 you know, describes something so interesting. Um, well, everything is interesting, but it's particularly interesting to our discussion over the last 10, 11 nights here, which is, you know, what are the implications of a life without God? This is very important, right? This is what we've been trying to tease out over these nights, right? Is how did we get here? What is our current situation? And what are some of the things and awareness and things that we can do to try to, um, I don't think we can remedy it, but at least um, uh, reduce some of the more disastrous consequences of, um, of liberalism and the doctrines of liberalism and the incipient effects of it. And here Allah says in Surah Hashar that do not be like those who forgot God. That do not be like those who forgot God and then they forgot themselves. That to forget God is to essentially to forget yourself. It's a very profound statement from the Quran. You know, and these are the people who are fasiqun, um, right? That they, they, they are essentially, they become evildoers. Just so interesting here. So the people that forget God forget themselves. That to not know God is to not know yourself because God created us in his image. Not in his literal image. As Imam Rada says, he chose for us this image. This is the meaning of it. Imagino Dei, right? It's the Latin. To forget God is to forget our very selves. But then again, well, I could come and say these things and many people don't really take it seriously. <laughs> I often mention that, right? And that's a sign of how far or how close we are to Allah. The fact that you could mention this and someone just be like, yeah, okay, let's move on. But the Qur'an makes a very extremely profound statement here. So the question that I would then raise, and then we're going to come to kind of some points wrapping up all these nights. Can you be good in the eyes of Allah and not be religious? <coughs> the answer is no. Not in an absolute sense. Because Allah says those who forget God forget themselves. Those who forget God forget themselves and they are fasiqun. Now, yes, there are, there are of course, you know, contextual reasons for this, right? Um, but there's another ayah. وَقِيلَ الْيَوْمْ نَنْسَاكُمْ كَمَا نَسِيتُمْ لِقَاءَ يَوْمِكُمْ In Surah Jathiyah, ayah 34, that it is said, Qila, on that day, Qila al yom nansakum, you forgot. Nansakum. Kama nasitum nika yomikum, that rather you have been forgotten. Just as you forgot. Here, forgot doesn't mean like I forgot to pick up the laundry. No. Here, forgot means neglected. Just as you neglected the day that you will meet us. Meaning the meeting with God, judgment, masuliyat, qiyamat, ma'ad. That you forgot that, so now we forget you. Hada ma'wa'kum an-nar. Yomikum hada wa ma'wa'kum an-nar. So now your abode shall be hell. 
Is there any way to square this and say everyone is on the same plane? Honestly, I will ask the relativists and the hippie new age social scientists, social media mongers, or whatever they are, is there a way to take the Quran and to say everyone is the same? Clearly, the Quran is making a judgment. I'm not saying we are. The Quran is making it. Now, who it applies to, it doesn't apply, leave that aside. But the Quran is making a very decisive judgment. There are those who remember and those who choose not to remember. And clearly, there are two paths articulated by the Quran. وَمَا لَكُمْ مِنْ نَاصِرِينَ And Allah says, on that day, there will be nobody to help. You chose to forget God. Now you live with the consequences of that very decision. How is it possible to be truly good in the eyes of God without God himself? And so often we buy into these things. Oh my God. Oh, I met this boy. I met this girl. But he's a good person. She's a good person. Or I'm a good person. Go to the Quran and ask yourself if you are good or not. Stop making up stuff. It is so irritating. Just making stuff up as you go along because you people want to justify their gunagara and their sin. So they just fabricate ideas and fabricate asbab and reasons and, and justifications for things that have no justifications. It's called being intellectually dishonest. So I would say it's willful, some kind of willful, self-imposed, you know, delusion. There are those who remember and those who do not. And there's a framework for this. La yastawi ashabu nar wa ashabu jannah Allah now goes on to say in another verse that the people of hell, of the fire, and the people of jannah are not the same. La yastawi ashabun ashabun nar wa ashabu jannah ashabul jannah hum al faizun and the people of heaven are faizun here i'm not saying i'm not here qualifying it what i'm saying is the quran makes an absolute clear declaration about this you cannot be a muslim and i will make this declaration you cannot be a muslim if you don't believe in heaven and hell and that there are certain people that go to hell and there are certain people that go to heaven. And there are certain things that are attributes of Ashabul Jannah among the remembrance of God, the belief in God, the belief in the Day of Judgment, a life that is shaped around the idea that we will meet God, we will return to Him, and there is a certain life to be lived in a specific way, with specific requirements, with the specific akhlaq, with the specific intimacy, intimate relations, with specific rules regarding to marriage, so that we meet God saying that we tried our best to live in a way that is in, the, in, you know, in line with His divine will. And then there's a life that is Devoid of that. And now, inshallah, we fall into the first category. And even we don't know for ourselves. So we're not here to judge over anyone. We don't know if we're from Ashab jannah But you cannot say that there is no judgment. That is just ridiculous. But this is the world in which we live, right? This is the, the, the hippie, new age fluff, postmodernism, whatever you want to call it, nonsense, and then people choose their spouses on the basis of that. You know, and, and build their families and, their, and, and, and all of this on that basis. This is a world in which Taylor Swift I didn't even know who she was really until I saw the article in the BBC. This is international news. Bye -bye. International news. BBC International. This person, who I don't think is worthy of, of any newspaper, made it into BBC International News. Do you know, want to know why? Seriously, this was yesterday's BBC International News. Because she created a 2.3 seismic earthquake from the people jumping up and down to her filth. 
the largest man-made earthquake in human history because of Taylor Swift in Seattle. 140,000 fans going absolutely ecstatic. They were jumping so much they registered a seismic event in Seattle. So, you know, our youths are so interested in these things, unfortunately, this, this ridiculousness. So I looked up, is Taylor Swift religious? Because, the, you, know, you know, if you, if you refer to people like that, you know, you get more credit maybe among the youngsters, unfortunately, right? So I looked up, I Googled Taylor Swift plus religion, right? Because I see, is that seismic earthquake, you know, saying hallelujah, hallelujah, or what? It's a seismic earthquake, 2.3 seismic earthquake registered. What is it for? And I found out some information here. If one thing is clear from all of this is that Taylor Swift has established her own relationship with faith. So again, it doesn't matter what God says. I got my own way, right? This whole notion of I create my own way, I create my own identity. Although her beliefs deviate from some of Christianity's traditional values, she stands firm in her faith. Baba, how do you stand firm in your faith when your values deviate from the very principles of the faith that you claim to adhere to? It's complete... Intellectual violence. I call this intellectual violence. It is intolerable as a professor of religion. Unless we just study the whole thing as an anthropological experiment, like watching monkeys in the zoo, intellectually, you can't square it. Mantik, mantik, baba. Logic, it doesn't go. So don't call yourself a Christian. Call yourself something else. New age, scientist, I don't know what you want to call yourself. Call yourself something else. And people who are consuming this filth day in and day out, this nonsense, whether it be in images or social media or YouTube or whatever, I don't know, all these things, they're being bombarded by these things, become influenced. Just like Justin Bieber, apparently he's a committed Christian. And if I was to ask my Christian colleagues, I think I once mentioned to him, and I think he almost spit out his coffee. He actually choked as we were eating, and he's like, he almost begged me to please, 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 please. Just, he's not a committed Christian. Please do not identify him as a representation of the church. But that's how low it's gone, right? That people are clinging to these kinds of role models for their meaning of life, right? And I describe this nothing, I think Cardinal Sara describes this as well, the Nigerian bishop, he says, this is nothing but a march towards solitude, sadness, and death. It is a march towards sadness, solitude, and a culture of death. A neo-barbarism of post-humans. He calls it post-humans. Some call it post-moral age, some call it a post-human age. The Quran would call it a post-human age. Because there's insan and an'am in the Quran. We either qualify as human beings or qualify for animals or maybe a mixture of both. But you're in one camp or the other in some sense or, or another. In an'am or in san. So it's maybe a post-human age. Who knows? Post-human, post-moral, I don't know what. Post-modern. We're past post-modern now, they're saying. <laughs> And imagine that people actually care about these things. I mean, this is the thing that just, I shake my head as an educator. I just shake my head and I don't understand it. It's just, if you sit back and just think for a moment, you laugh too. You know, we describe this in myth as called the Faustian bargain. Faustian bargain is it's a German myth or a discussion about a man who makes a deal with the devil. Right? And we know Lenin made a deal with the devil, as we know, that famous singer from the Beatles, right? That he writes it's in his memoirs and his autobiography that basically he was brought up in a home of promiscuity and men and coming and going from his mother's home and and, and he ran away from home and he made a deal and he says he asked the devil, he said, you give me fame and I will give you my soul. This is very common among these people, 
It's called the Faustian bargain. You know, that you give me what I want and I'll give you my soul. And I'll do your work for you. It's very common because Lenin was a follower of Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley, of course, as you know, was the most famous devil, Satan, black magic person of the 20th century. This is not, I mean, this is, this is known. Aleister Crowley was, in, was, was, was put on the album of the Beatles. I mean, so what's my point here? My point is that this is, this is, this is essentially the equation. It's a, it's a sale of one's soul to the devil, that participating in this kind of stuff is essentially almost like participating in some kind of devil satanic rituals. I mean, to create a seismic event from jumping up and down to a barely clothed young lady with a microphone. And this is the pride of being Canadian or American? BBC International News. I mean, I think it's more of a commentary on where human beings are at and their values. And people may laugh here, but you'd be surprised. Young Muslims and young Shias, Shia Muslims, consume this. And, and, and often we turn a kind of innocent eye to it because we don't understand the, the very deep and dark currents that run underneath it. Deep and dark, dark satanic currents run under all of this industry. Right? And, 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 and I think that's why we have to remind our kids about how vacuous it is, how bereft of meaning it is. Give them alternatives like, mashallah, what we saw today. That's the alternative. The wonderful youths coming and reciting what Ahl al Bayt Nothing more to be proud of. I mean, one of the beautiful things I've seen in this community, among many other things, is the youngsters participating in the matam, in the nohas, in the marsiyas, in, in the recitation of hadith al kisa, in, you know, in, in all of these things. This is something to be proud of. I mean, the matam last night, mashallah, at the recitation of the nohas. They were all youngsters, right? Mostly youngsters, right, doctor? So let's build on this and increase it. And they should, inshallah, understand what they're saying as well. So there are alternatives, alhamdulillah. And this is a blessing to their parents. Whoever their parents are, if they're here, I don't know. May Allah bless all of you, Jamia. Because the thank goes to Allah, Imam, and their parents for teaching them the right things. So there are great examples out there. But who our children associate will determine what direction they go. And this is what our Imam died for at the end of the day, didn't he? As Imam said, what do we read in Ziyarat Arba'in? Badala muhajatahu fiq. That, oh, Imam Hussein, you gave up your blood. Muhajjah means the blood of your heart, but you gave up your blood. For the sake of Allah, fika. Liyastanqida ibadik min al jahala wa hayrati dalala. So to save God's servants and slaves from the depths of ignorance and misguided confusion. The whole message of Imam Hussein has come to save us from the likes of people like Taylor Swift. In today's, if we want to translate it to today's time. From that complete nonsense, Imam Hussein and his Azadari and the institution of Azadari and having centers like Baytul Qaim and others like it is a candle of hope. And may Allah bless the, the, the one of the founders who passed away today and raised his rank, inshallah. Allah maqama. Against a, 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 an over, a, a tidal wave of just complete jahalat and hayratul dalala, right? So I want to conclude 
as I said, I won't take too much time tonight. What do we stand to lose if we lose religion? And then conversely, what do we gain? I'll leave you with five points. And then I promise, doctor, that I will send him a list of the books that I've mentioned in this talks. And maybe he can publish it on the website, or I don't know, I'm sure you have some way of disseminating information among the people who attend the center. And then the Mominian can refer to those books and get them from Amazon or where, however you want to order them, it's fine. Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in his work, Religion and Science, The Search for Meaning. It's a very, very beautiful book. Of course, Jonathan Sachs is the, is the chief rabbi, one of the chief rabbis of the UK. He was a student at Oxford in philosophy, very serious guy in, in the realm of religion and philosophy. He mentions five things that human beings stand to lose if they walk away from religion. By walk away from religion, meaning a religion that guides your life. Like all the mu'minin here, for you, deen guides you in your life, and for your wives and your children, inshallah, and grandchildren. What would our society and humanity look like without it? Or with this whole spiritual but not religious, that also counts as losing religion. Number one, it's a loss of the sanctity of life and human dignity. Life is given sanctity from where, Mu'mineen? From God. No one will deny that, I think, in terms of people of religion. Human life is given its sanctity from the one who has created it. To sever that link is a pushes humanity on a step towards a culture of death, which is where we're at almost now, right? I mean, I mean, there are so many elements. I'm not saying that people that don't believe in religion don't honor human life, but the roots of that honor, the roots of, 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 of the hurmat of insan, as Ahlul Bayt tell us, as we read in the tradition, so that the honor or the dignity or the value of one human life is more valuable than the Kaaba itself. Right? The, the taking of human life, the disposal of human life, so naturally, we would not be accept euthanasia. You know, we would not accept this. That's why we're even so careful about pulling the plug, so to speak. Right? And that's why our maraja, most of them until now, don't accept the concept of brain death. We go towards heart, the, the, you know, cardiovascular failure. Right? The heart failure as opposed to, you know, the heart has to stop as opposed to the brain stem activity. Because there's such a, 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 a sanctity in life that this whole idea of just pulling the plug, I'm not saying it can't be done, you know, there are certain circumstances, heart death, we know, is so sacred. Right? So we come at, we approach a life that it's such a gift from God. And it has to be honored and cherished and protected at every step of the way from every angle, inshallah. And naturally, because of that, we would be completely opposed to this army of death ISIS. There's nothing to, like, like, it's completely in opposition to this notion of the honor of human life. Look at Imam Hussein at the very last moments, he's saying, let us go to Medina. We read the maktal on Friday. Why? Imam doesn't want to fight and die and kill and all of these things unless it's, there's no, all other options are exhausted. All other means are exhausted. And even then, it's in defense. That's Islam. That's the sanctity of human life. But what happens without religion, then, you know, ultimately what happens is the individual passions become the criteria for how people live their life. The individual, what we call religion, becomes a hobby. You know, David Bentley Hart says something so fascinating, another very important author. I know I like to mention different people just because we read these different authors. He's a very important person, very important American scholar. He says, why is it that today an American can wake up as a Christian and go to bed as a Buddhist? Like, how does that even work? And then wake up the next day as an atheist, and then go and buy some ring charm or something, or wind charm, and then hang that up in their car, and that should do the trick for another week, and then move on to something else, and then, and then go to nothing again. 
Why is that so common in Western society? What does it tell us about the loss of meaning? The lo what does it tell us as a commentary just about how vacuous and empty people's lives are? They think religion is such a joke, like it's just a weekend hobby, Hart says, David Bentley Hart at Yale, published by Yale University Press. He says that they, they think it's some kind of, uh, like it's you, a car model building or something. And this is very common, right? Because they're spiritual. Oh, but I'm spiritual. This is, it's meaningless, right? But this is what happens, right? They don't end up respecting themselves. And this is what Allah says, that, that, that we shall forget them because they forgot the day of judgment. They forgot Yom al They forgot Yom al -Din. Number two. Oh, and then of course, life becomes disposable itself. Right? The whole notion of eliminating a life from the womb of a mother. I don't know, it's just so disturbing to me. I don't know, maybe I'm the, I, I don't know, hopefully other women are also disturbed by it, I would hope. I mean, I'm so disturbed, I don't even know how to express my emotions. That's how you should feel. That's insane. Not a toy to prod and to break the uterus so the water can come out and the vacuum or something. Like, what is going on, man? But human life loses value. And eugenics and all this Frankenstein that people want to play with, 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 with human being, with human life. Humans become disposable. Then we have the loss of politics, of covenant. I don't want to go too much into this, but politics loses its meaning when things are not rooted in responsibility to a higher power. Not in claims, but truly in the belief that power comes from above. And people become jaded and cynical about the political process and they don't participate in it because it's not done in good faith. And that good faith comes from where? Why do we use the word good faith? huh? Do you ever think about it, done in good faith? Faith in what? In what system, in what laws? In your laws or in God's laws? Good faith, right? Done in good faith. See, these religious idioms are still a part of the society, but as Chidek, Hart, and others tell us, they have, no, they have no meaning anymore. They don't qualify for anything particular. Muslims are the last man standing and women standing. We are really one of the last people standing that actually these, these things mean something very specific. They have a fiqh, they have a way of life, they have a way that they live. There are things they can and that they cannot do and Muslims tend to, inshallah, live their life in that way. Number three, a loss of morality. Does this mean that without religion people become immoral? No. Not necessarily, but there is no doubt that the concept of what is moral or immoral loses its power. And I'll tell you why it loses its power. I'll tell you why. It loses its power because when it is no longer connected to a set of divine principles, to a sharia, to a fiqh, to an akhlaq, to a sunnah, it now only connotes something, it does not denote something. Connote means like when you think of a word, you think of a million different ways that you could describe something. You think of progression, you think of big house, good this, clean water, but if you ask, define it for me, you can't, no one person will have the same definition of the word progression here. I don't think so. Each of us will conjure up something in our imagination. This is what it means to connote something. It connotes something. A denote means it's defined, it's inscribed. It has a border, hudud. Religion gives us the border within which to play the game. When you remove the border on the field, and now you say be moral, now we say, well, what's moral to you is not moral to me. 
مزنة So we lose that sense of morality. Now, sex now comes to the number four, the loss of marriage. Interesting why he singles this out as being such an epidemic problem in the human community, especially the West. He says that relationships are no longer treated as sacred institutions. Patience and perseverance are gone. Again, why? Because husband and wife get in a fight. Well, what's moral to you is moral to you. What's moral to me is moral to me. You can't have a consensus on a specific set of teachings. A specific set of principles. A specific set of duties. A specific set of obligations. A specific set of akhlaqiyat. That's why interfaith marriage is a mess, Baba. Mess. No, it's, it's common sense why it would put someone into a complete mess. I mean, it, it's a quagmire. You're getting yourself wrapped up into something that's very, very complicated. Even if it is allowed in certain circumstances, I'm not denying that. It doesn't mean it's the, you know, a go-to option. And then you find later on, later on, the love or the lust starts vaporing out. How many hundreds and hundreds of these cases I've presided over? I started in this field what, when I was in my late 20s. I'm now turning 40. And I shouldn't have seen this much. And I don't even, I'm not even a resident alim and I've seen this much. I mean, what about our resident ulama? They probably 10 times more, 100 times more. Right, the lust starts dissipating. This starts the initial spark of the of the lust and the initial things start going away. And then, where's the common values? Where's the common akhlaqiyat? Where's the common aqidah to come together? The common love. Not only values, but w the love that brings them together. That love of Allah, the love of community, the love of service. Right, to see goodness in one another. Don't. Think for a second that, 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 that somehow, you know, without religion, it'll be better off. Again, I'm not saying people can't have a healthy relationship without religion. I'm just saying that it becomes a lot harder. And unfortunately, even in our community, would Allah be happy, honestly, that couples are spent getting divorced and spending a hundred large USD, or 50 or 100 in Canada at least, fighting each other in court over kids and over money. Either or both sides are going bankrupt because they want to take each other to the cleaners, so to speak. I mean, I don't even know how that has entered into the vocabulary of Muslims. I've heard this from sisters and brothers. I'm going to take her to the cleaners. I'm going to take him to the cleaners. I don't even know why that is in the vocabulary of our Shias, or our Muslims. And we know from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq it is highly problematic, <laughs> highly, 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 highly problematic to go to a non-Muslim judge to settle something that our religion has given us clear guidance about how to settle. And then spending 50, 100,000, 25,000, 25,000 on the low end. These lawyers are 400, 500, 900 dollars an hour. Not condemning that. Everyone has a right to earn a living, but those billable hours add up, especially in your family. Let's go. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I know brothers got to sell their car, mortgage their house. I, I'm legit. I mean, I, 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 I said, yeah. <laughs> But the first family lawyers, they, they, I mean, they just salivate, right? Because you, you're angry, and then they take advantage of al ghadab bin shaitan, right? Shaitan has come in the heart. There's so much anger and, 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 and fire in them, right? Fire and brimstone. And they just see ding, cha ching, cha ching in their eyes, right? Honestly, the minimum case that I've dealt with is like 75K. 
right? Plus retainer. And after all of that, is the ruling even pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What does it say about human beings? What does it say about the problem? In, and this is in our Shia community. This is, this is despicable. This is unacceptable. This is, this is a complete failure in morality and ethics. For either side. It's not against women or men. But this is what Jonathan Sachs says, that one of the institutions that are most profoundly affected by the loss of religion is marriage. It's marriage. Right? And the divorce rate is hovering somewhere around 50% in the UK, 50% in Canada. I don't know, the US is somewhere around that rate as well. And the Muslim community is around the same. Give or take 10%, perhaps the Muslim community is not, it can't sit on any holy pedestal. So they could be Muslim by name, but in their morality and their ethics and the way they frame their life, And he goes on to cite other statistics. Again, alhamdulillah, a lot of this doesn't apply to us, right? 50% of children born out of wedlock. In the UK, it's closer to 60% born out of wedlock. Alhamdulillah, Muslims are not in that. I, I don't think we, we're, we have that, those kind of statistics, thank God. Fewer marry now, even. Sachs talks about this, why people choose not to get married, why procreation is such a problem for people. Having children is, is not really a blessing for so many people anymore. Why? It's because they don't live for God anymore. They live for their own selfish selves. This is Jonathan Sachs, not me. This is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. The book is wonderful. It's called Religion and the Search... A religion and Science to Search for Meaning. It's a, it's a very nice book, and the chapter on marriage is extremely important because it's the same values between Islam and Judaism and Christianity, right, on these issues. They forget themselves and they forget Allah, and Allah forgets them. Call us. Because everybody wants to live for the fulfillment of what they want and not God, and they don't realize. And then are they happy at the end of the day? No. Look at the depression statistics. Humankind has never been as depressed as they are today. So the depression or the rise in, in, in unhappiness is going higher and higher and higher day by day. So clearly, the road that insan has chosen to take is not exactly panned out very well. And lastly, he says, just more generally, the loss of a meaningful life. Again, I'm not saying that people that don't have religion don't have a meaningful life. They can have a meaningful life, but they're traveling blind in this world. Traveling blind. So they're rolling the dice, really. And on the other hand, a religion that's not informed by the ethics of love and forgiveness and mercy, it's not a religion at all. So the religion of ISIS and extreme RSS and extreme Hinduism and extreme Zionism and all of these things is not a religion at all. A religion that instrumentalizes political power and, and sectarianism for the means of achieving political aims is not a religion at all. So yes, religion can easily be instrumentalized and weaponized by the people that want to use it for their own political and um, you know, Machiavellian aims. There's no doubt about that. I'm not naive to this. I'm not naive to that. But that's not religion. That's not the religion of Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's not the religion of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. That's not the religion of Rasulullah. It's not. And my dear brothers and my dear sisters, religion will always be misused. Please stop coming to me and giving me examples in the past where religion was misused and that's why you don't want religion. It is so selective. Like seriously. Again, these are cop-outs. 
as a historian of religion, religion has been vastly a force largely for good than it has for bad. Overwhelmingly a force for good than it has been a force for killing and murder and, and uh, you know, and, and things like this. And even that, specifically within Islam, specifically within the madhab of Ahlul Bayt we're speaking of here. Look at Iraq, and I'll conclude on this note, which brings us to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Everything that Iraq has been through, yet Sayyid Sistani until this day is hailed as a paragon of peace among Sunnis, Christians, Yazidis, you name it. Even after the bombing and the destruction of Samarra, at the point where the blood of the Shias have never boiled like that, perhaps in decades and decades, I remember, yet he pulled the reins back on the Shias in, in Iraq. What does that tell us about our madhab? reprisals and revenge attacks and bombings and all this stuff. Yet Shias were dying in the thousands per month at a point. What does it tell us about the advice that he gave to those that went to fight ISIS about securing the environment, securing women and children from harm? If somebody comes and repents or doesn't want to fight or something, there's a whole, you leave them, leave them be. Like there's so much rules of engagement in the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt, or in the fiqh of Islam, but especially in the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt. You'd be amazed. And the way Sayyid Sistani put his foot down in Iraq, and yes, did atrocities still occur? Sure they do. But don't come to me and pull some statistics here and there and say, oh yeah, Molana, see, see, see. You know, look at the whole picture. Study the whole picture. Understand the context. And there will be anomalies. But human beings, when they have a sickness in their heart, as Allah says, they go towards the anomalies as an excuse to justify their own guilty consciousness. People use anomalies in order to justify their own disconnection from a religion or a faith that tells them what they're doing is wrong. And this is what Imam Hussein died for. This is what he died for. This was his message. This is what happened to him. There were no rules of engagement with Imam Hussein. After they beheaded the Imam, alayhi salam, Saduk narrates in his Amali that his horse stood over his body. This is narrated by Imam Zain al Abidin. The horse of Imam al Hussein stood guard over his body. And you know what the horse began to do? It's narrated by Sheikh Saduk, very early source of history, of hadith. He began rubbing his mane in the blood of Imam Hussein. Began wiping his mane and and, and weighing and going up and down and up and down and up and down. And then it returned to the women. And that's when we heard, Illa Masra'ika Mubadirat. And they came running out of the tents. Because the horse came back, the saddle was turned upside down, it was stained in the blood of Imam Hussein. Salamullah alayhi, and the women were Illa Masra'ika Mubadirat. And we read in the ziyarah of Imam Muhammad Zaman, and they came running, Mubadirat to their Hussein, salam فَأَرَّفْنَا أَنَّ حُسَيْنَ قَدْ قُتِلَ Right? And then it is said, Um Kulthum said, and then, or rather the women then found out that Hussein has been killed. فَخَرَجَدْ أُمْ Kulthum بِنْتُ الْحُسَيْنَ That one of the first to come out was Um Kulthum. When the news came, the khabar came that Hussein has been killed, قَدْ قُتِلَ Husayna, That her Hussein has been killed, Um Kulthum comes out and she begins to put her hand on her head and she just begins to scream one thing, Wa Muhammada, Wa Muhammada, Wa Muhammada. And that's all that she began to scream. So now imagine this scene, brothers. 
Because what happened was that the women ran out of the tents. So take your, your heart and your mind to Karbala, Muqaddasa, the holy land of Karbala. The women have run out of the tents. Their horse has returned bloodied. They now begin, as Imam Sadiq salam tells us, they begin to loot the body of Imam Hussein salam. Right, so the body of Abu Abdullah, right, Suliba Makana Al Hussein. Suliba, yeah, looting. They begin to plunder the body of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But they did not plunder it in private, they plunder it in the view of the women and the, the children. Remember, because the tents were already set on fire, the women were already running out. So it is very, very realistic that they would have seen the scene going on. Huli took the head of Imam Hussein so that he could show it to Ibn Ziyad. And when Hussein was killed, Tabari reports that the people told Sinan that you did this for a worldly booty, you have you know, worldly gain, yani ghanima, and you have come to claim your thawab. Even if they give you houses full of money for the killing of Hussein, it will never be enough what they've given you. Sinan goes to the tent in the door of Umar ibn Sa'd. And did you know he had a special poetry to recite as they rode over the back in the front of Imam Hussein? They have special shairi for it. They were composing special poetry, right? Radadnahu, yani min zahrihi wa min wara, and on and on that we, we rode over the front and then we turned him over and rode over the back. They had poetry that they would recite as they were riding their horses up and down on Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And that's why, of course, we read this has all happened after the passing of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And that's why Imam Rida says to us that in tahabu thiqlahu, right? Fala ghafar Allah dhalika lahum abada. Imam Rida said that his possessions were stolen. His women were taken prisoner, and Allah will never forgive them for this. There is no, there is no maghfira for them. La ghafara Allahu dhalika lahum abada. Abada. Forever, Imam Rida says. Why? Because Suliba is Haq ibn Haywal Hadrami Qamisul Hussein, that they tore the shirt of Hussein off. Wa akhala sayfuhu rajulun min bani nahshal. And a man from Bani Nashr took the sword of Imam Hussein. Imam Sadiq tells us that the body was found with 30 or 34 strikes. In another riwayah, it says 320 wounds in total. His amama was taken by Ahnas bin Murshid. His slippers were taken by Aswad bin Khalid. These are all lanat on them. Aswad bin Khalid took the slippers of Imam Hussein. Yajdal bin Sulaym al Kalbi, la'anahumullah, found the ring of Imam Hussein. But the finger must have been swollen. So Yajdal, la'anahumullah, had to improvise something to get the ring that he wanted from the finger of Imam Hussein. So he did what he did with his tools. We don't need to talk about that. And then came the, sar the Sarawil or Sirwal of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. I won't even translate that from Arabic to English. فَأَخَذَ بَحْرِ إِنَّقَابِ سَرَاوِيلُهُ وَتَرَكُهُ مُجَرَّدًا And the Sirwal the garment of Imam Hussein was taken and he was left mujarradan. <laughs> this is why we say assalamu ala al-atsam al ariyat That peace be upon the bodies that are exposed in Karbala. This is the salam of Imam al-Zaman. Assalamu ala jasadihi al-maslub, right? This is not from Imam al-Zaman. This is our salam to him. That peace be upon the body that was insulted. Assalamu ala mahtuk al khibar. Imam al Zaman says, Peace be upon the tents that were ripped open. Why? Because we read, and again, I'm not embellishing here. Tabari tells us, and I will read you exactly, and this will be enough to break stones in half. And I will conclude on this narration here. 
تابري نيريتش فإن كانت المرأة لتنازع الثوبها عن ظهرها that if the woman resisted they would tear the hijab off the outer clothing the thobe it just says thobe so it you know, means hijab they would tear the outer garment off عن ظهرها from her back حتى تغلب عليه فيذهب به منها until he would take off with what he wanted. This is word for word as it's written in the history of Islam, of Sunni and Shia history. This is the musibah of Ahlul Bayt. Now imagine how they were brought into Sham. What is the musibah of the ladies of Banu Hashim? how they were brought into Sham, what was done to them when they came into Sham. Right? They were brought into the market, as we know.